Resurrection Sunday service today. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. These are the words of God. That if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes to righteousness and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. But the scripture says, whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. For well, heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of the Lord will remain forever. Amen. Amen. This morning, it is my great privilege, as it was on Friday, not just to preach Christ crucified, but this morning to preach Christ resurrected from the dead. Uh, today, the topic itself, or the title, is The Great Confession of Christ's resurrection. It's not something uh, historically that has been confessed. It is something that we confess each day of our lives by living in the light and the truth and the power of Christ's resurrection. The great confession is representative of our lives. So today I hope for you to see that by God's grace. We're going to look at three verses and three points. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. I'll leave it on there for a while with the main point. We're firstly, in verse 9, going to look at a confession regarding the sufficiency of Christ. The sufficiency of Christ. That is, Christ obtained salvation and rose from the dead as his validation of that alone. He did the work himself. That's why we have that stained glass mirror there to your right-hand side in the middle, it says sola Christus. I'm not a Latin scholar, but it, it means that Christ has done that work alone. Sola is alone. If you go solo, you're going on your own. Sola Christus. Christ alone. Our hope is in him and him alone. Amen. It's a beautiful history of stained glass windows as people who couldn't read or write would see the pictures. And of course, we've got some Latin up there to help us along. So we've got, secondly, a confession regarding the salvation of the soul in verse 10. It's a saving confession that we make. We're saved by that confession in Christ when it comes from the heart. And thirdly, verse 11, a confession regarding Scripture's promise to, bel to the believer. We don't have a living Christ to look to, he is reigning in heaven above, but we have his living word that the Spirit animates. And in that same gospel confidence, we look to his word as that light that reminds us that we have life in him. The main point being that those who confess and believe on Christ Jesus will be saved. And here's our little icing on the cake at the end, and will never be ashamed. There's a lot of things you may do in your life that you'll be ashamed about, but when you believe on Christ and put your whole heart and faith and trust in Him, you will never be ashamed. Scripture's wonderful promise of this gospel good news that we can put our hope in. Now, our context for this passage is, of course, the salvation that is secured for us in Christ, not just by Christ's perfect life and his atoning death, but in his being resurrected from the dead as a proof that he has, as we saw on Friday, power over death. That's what the resurrection proves. He can pay for sins, but the resurrection to life means that Jesus is indeed God. We can even claim that any man can die on a cross, and any man can die, but it is the resurrection, saints, that is proof that God himself in Christ is God in flesh. And so we've got this beautiful picture here where we can now rightly, or Jesus can rightly and truly promise eternal life to all those who put their faith in him and him alone. This is the great topic of the preaching today. Now, J.C. Ryle 
We're talking about uh, the importance of resurrection. I wanted to just sort of lay a quote before you here. He says, we need not wonder that so much importance is attached to our Lord's resurrection. It is the seal and headstone of the great work of redemption, which he came to do. It is the crowning proof that he has paid the debt which he undertook to pay on our behalf, won the battle which he fought to deliver us from hell and is accepted for our surety and our substitute by our Father in heaven. Had he never come forth from the prison of the grave, how could we ever have been sure that our ransom had been fully paid, Ryle says. Had he never risen from his conflict with the last enemy, how could we have ever felt confident that he had overcome death? And him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. But thanks be to God, Ryle says, that we are left in no doubt the Lord Jesus really rose for our justification and true Christians are begotten again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, that they may boldly say with Paul, who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died and it is Christ that is risen again, end quote. What a great way to set out this sermon before us of the importance of the resurrection. I love what Stephen Lawson says, that uh, the stone was rolled away not to let Jesus out, but to let the world in. I love that thought, that we now see the resurrected Christ and we can come to him to receive that life that is in him. Well, our text this morning, and I trust you've got your Bibles open, is in Romans chapter 10. Now, this text is often preached in the context of saving faith. If you will confess and if you will make a verbal declaration that Christ is Lord, you will be saved. I want you to see it in a, in a, in a, a broader light this morning. And I also want to get some context by going back to Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Would you turn there with me, please, and we'll have a look at it on the screen. Paul begins by praying for those whom God is going to save. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He's praying for God's nation of Israel. For I bear them record that they have a knowledge of Oh, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Verse 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Another word that could be best translated there for end is Christ is the goal of the law. For righteousness to everyone that believes. This is why we don't look to the law anymore to save us. We look to Christ who fulfilled the law on our behalf and our righteousness is now found in his obedience and his fulfillment. Paul wants God's people Israel to be saved and he is concerned about them. Of course, the sealing of our salva salvation is seen not just in the cross but in the resurrection because we're saved to new life. We died in him but we are risen in him also and Paul is concerned for God's people Israel that they are zealous for God. They want God so to speak. They are wanting to pursue the God of Israel but they don't know the gospel. The gospel in Christ. They know the gospel in the prophets, in Moses, so to speak, as far as the Old Testament writings, but they don't know its fulfillment, the end of what righteousness is in Christ. And it is even today that the people of Israel, our prayer should still go on for them, shouldn't it? That they would be saved, that God would gather the Jews from all over the globe and bring them to himself. And this remains. Jewish people, even today, as many of us know, are still awaiting their Messiah. They're still waiting for this Messiah, this long-awaited one to, to come. How sad that is that they've completely missed the Messiah of, a, uh, Messiah of Isaiah 53. And just reading from an author here, 
who explains uh, that they've even taken out Isaiah 53 from their readings. He says the 17th century Jewish historian Raphael Levi admitted that long ago the rabbis used to read Isaiah 53 in the synagogues. Of course, that's the suffering servant uh, chapter where it's the one who comes and suffers and dies for his people. Of course, that clearly pictures Christ. But after the chapter was read, uh, he says, arguments and great confusion from the rabbis would come about. Uh, and so they would simply then take this prophecy, a decision was made to take this prophecy from the Haftarah readings in the synagogues and simply no longer read it. And that's why he says here in this article I'm reading, that's why today we read Isaiah 52, we stop in the middle of the chapter and, uh, and, the, and the week, and after that we jump straight to Isaiah 54. You can't be saved outside of Christ and to take out the reading of Isaiah 53 is uh, a real um, picture of the blindness of Israel still that they have in part. So the Jews without a saviour, what does it say in Romans 1 through 4 there? Well, they aim to establish their own righteousness before God. This is because we are made in God's image Instinctively and innately, we know that we need to live good lives and that evil is a bad thing. This comes from our conscience, which God gives us, the ability to know right from wrong. So outside of Christ, we try and be good. We try and establish our own righteousness. This is a form of zeal, verse 2, that we see in the passage there, to make ourselves right before God. If we don't have a gospel, we want to just be good people, we want to do what's right before God and we want to establish our own righteousness. And in seeking to establish our own righteousness, we don't inevitably submit to God's standard or measurement of righteousness, which is found in Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fall short of God's righteous standard. There is none righteous, no, not one. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20 Solomon puts it this way, Surely there is no righteous man on the earth who never sins. Our only hope is found in verse 4. Have a look at it with me. This is the answer for Paul and for the Jews, and of course for us, Jew and Gentile, in verse 4, that Christ came to what? Fulfill the law. He is the goal of the law. He is the end of the law. I did not come to abolish the law, Jesus said. I came to establish the law, to fulfill the law. So those that then who believe on him, and today as we'll see, confess him, are made righteous in his obedience. Our sins were uh, imputed to him on the cross, and his righteousness, his whole fulfilling of the law, is fulfilled in us. That's the gospel. Not the law's no longer around, it's the end of the law, and we live by grace. That is a, an erroneous gospel. Jesus, we live in the spirit and the moral expectation of the law, amen, and we do that by the grace of God through faith in Christ. It's both law and grace now, but we're not living in righteous obedience to the law because those standards have been met in Christ and we're fulfilled and perfected in Him. But ultimately, I'm going to go on to explain that today because our Confession is a righteous confession. And so this law uh, that Christ fulfills, he's the end of the law. And uh, we're saved, not in our own righteous outworking of the law, but in his righteousness. We're saved in him and we have no need to be ashamed. This is, quite frankly, everyone, why every other religion in the world endeavours to establish their own goodness. It's about you getting better, doing more, trying harder, and you become the end of your own salvation. Your good has to outweigh your bad. But the good news of the gospel isn't do more. The good news of the gospel is that it's done in Christ. It's done in Him. He, today, as we'll see, if you call on His name and believe on what He has accomplished is the end of your efforts to establish your own righteousness before a holy God. The end of your effort, like the Jews still do today, 
to attain your own righteousness in your own strength or in your own zeal, as Paul puts it there in the beginning of chapter 10, before a holy God. Now, this passage today, as we dive into verse 9, establishes two other things I want to show you. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. We can't say it's all in Christ and I've got nothing to do. Amen? You are to work out your salvation in fear and trembling. That's a warning that you've got to work out your salvation. Christ has done his work. We must do our work and we're going to talk about that. This is seen in the twin doctrines of God's sovereignty. That is, he's done what he has done. That is, he's raised his son from the dead. The work is complete and now we, man's sovereignty, we must live in it. So we see this in the passage today in Romans chapter 10 verses 9 through 11. In God's sovereignty is the resurrection and its verification. And man's responsibility, confession to salvation. One is sovereignty, one is stewardship. God's job, the resurrection of his son. He's done it. Our job, confession to salvation. So we can sit back today and say, well, we rejoice in the resurrection. God's done it all. I don't have to do anything. It's all by grace. No. You must now live in the confession of your faith and outwork it until Christ comes back for you or you go to be with him. Confession is not just what you say. Your confession is how you live. I'm going to say that again. Confession is not what you say alone. Your confession is backed up by how you live. So let's have a look at our first verse today together. Verse 9. Have a look at it in your Bibles with me. We're going to get six primary points out of verse 9. And I want you to see them as I point to them because these have a, have a weight upon us now as we think about our responsibility of what God's sovereignly done for us as Christians here today in light of the resurrection. Well, verse 9, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Six things. Number one, this confession is conditional. It is conditional. And it is time sensitive if the scripture says, you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And that is in this life. If you confess him that Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Make no mistake, you will eventually confess Christ, everyone in this room, in this life or in the next. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, that every, every knee, or that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. That is Paul's way of saying there that everything, let's go through it, in heaven, everyone living in earth and everything under the earth, that is in hell, is going to confess Jesus as Lord. Romans 14, 11, it is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. Yes, even the worst, most evil rulers in all of human history will have to confess Christ as Lord. So you either confess him in this life now and you are saved, but you will ultimately bow the knee to Christ in this life or in the next. But it's in this life that you can be saved by confessing his name. It is not a matter of if, saints, it is a matter of when. But all will confess him. The key to being saved, though, is to confess him in this life while you have breath. When you enter into eternity, it is too late. So it is a conditional promise, number one. Number two, sorry, I should be following along with this. Number two, it is to be done with your mouth. It is to be done out aloud with your mouth. You can't be saved apart from your confession, Listen a minute, everyone. You can't be saved, young people, through your parents' confession. You can't be saved through my confession. Well, I went to a church where the pastor was definitely a Christian preacher. 
You can't be saved through me. You're saved through your own confession in Christ. Wives, you can't be saved through your husband's confession. Husbands, you can't be saved through your wife's devotion and confession to the Lord. Clearly, the text uh, in the text, salvation is a personal and an individual responsibility. So you, individual here today, you must confess your salvation. You will give an account to Christ on that day and you will be there on your own. You will be judged according to your words and your good work. So it's an individual responsibility here. This is why we only baptize confessing Christians. It's actually why we don't baptize infants in this church, for only on the confession of your faith can we truly baptize you into Christ. According to Romans 10, 9 and 10, you've got to have made a confession that Jesus is Lord and that he has been risen or raised from the dead by the Father to actually be saved and therefore baptized into Christ. Amen? Thirdly, it's a confession not just of Jesus himself. Have a look in verse 9 here about Jesus as Lord. Confession is not just of Jesus, verse 9. It is a confession that what? Jesus is Lord, or the Lord Jesus, or Jesus as Lord. But I need you to see here that many today want a personal saviour. They want Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. So they want Jesus as saviour, but they don't want him as what? Lord. That is the Greek word kurios there. It means this, a person who is able to exercise ownership rights over someone else. Now, you can confess Christ as saviour. Jesus, I want you to save me. I don't want to go to hell. I really don't. And I think there's been many confessions of that over the years. But what we're talking about here is a confession of not just Jesus as saviour, but Jesus as kurios. Jesus as Lord. Jesus, you now have total ownership and rulership over my life. And as I lay down my life to obey you and not myself anymore, it is those people who will be saved. Jesus says it this way, why do you call me Lord and you don't do the things that I say? It's going to frustrate Jesus for you to say, Lord, you're my saviour, but you don't live anything out of the Bible. You don't repent of your sins. You don't walk in obedience to the Scriptures. What's all by grace now? Don't have to worry about the law. That's going to get Jesus quite angry with you. So we've got to be careful with these things. It is the confession of Jesus as Lord. And this profession, this confession of Lordship is a proof of our salvation. We obey Him because our old life is finished with. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So it's not just a confession of Jesus. It is a confession of Jesus as what, everyone? Lord. First century saints didn't say Caesar was Lord. They said Jesus is curious, Christos curios. And they got themselves killed for it. It is our confession today. The true church confesses Jesus as Lord. Fourthly, confession must come from a regenerated heart. You must believe. Have a look in verse 9. For with the mouth, the Lord, uh, you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and you shall believe in your heart. Friends, make no mistake, salvation is a heart issue. Salvation is a heart issue. It's not a head theory. You can understand all the mechanics of how God sent his son and how Christ supposedly rose from the dead. If you're an atheist or an agnostic, you can understand the gospel story, but you must make a confession, not from the head, but from the heart. 
It is not a confession, let me be clear here, about knowledge about Christ. Any unregenerate academic can do that. It is a confession from the heart in love for Christ. Let me say that again. It's not a confession of knowledge about Christ. It is a confession from the heart in love for Christ. You know, when we say, when something's from the heart, don't we? We mean, I'm genuine. It is something that we're genuine. But this confession is more than that. It comes from a heart that has a complete sovereign work of God enacted upon it. Why? Because you cannot give yourself what the Bible requires for you to make that confession. That is a new heart, a new disposition, a new desire for God that wasn't there before. It is the regenerating of a human heart. It is a complete work of God alone through His sovereign Spirit. Maybe we can turn in our Bibles here to Ezekiel chapter 36 for a minute and we'll have a look at this together. In Ezekiel chapter 36, we'll see what goes on here in salvation. In the Old Testament, it's prophesied by the prophet Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, verse 26. A new heart also will I give. So this is God giving those who will be regenerated, be given new life, resurrection life, a new heart also will I give, and a new spirit. So God's going to put that spirit inside of you with that new heart. I will put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of, um, out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You know you've got a new heart. You know you're regenerate because you're following God's word, God's commandments, God's statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and you shall do them. Well, here we have it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, sorry, chapter 12, verse 3. No man can say Jesus is Lord but by the Spirit of God. God's Spirit has to be in you to truly confess that Jesus is Lord. Let me render that in a way that it's probably more clearer to us here today. No man can say Jesus is Lord and truly mean it without the help of the Spirit of God. Because anyone can confess Jesus is Lord. Anyone can come to the front today and pray a prayer, if you like, but they don't mean it. It's not from a regenerated heart. It's not from the Spirit of God. So it must come from a regenerated heart. Fifthly, it is a confession of both Christ's death and resurrection. If you believe, have a look in verse 9 here again, if you believe that God has raised him from the dead. The focus here is not on the death, but on the raising of what God has done. Only God can raise people from the dead. What is the point of Christ's death without faith in a resurrection? You confess from the heart not only that Christ died for you, atonement and death in him, you confess Christ's resurrection and that you've got new life in him and watch this, because of that, you're living a different why? You will experience two resurrections. One, if you're a Christian, you'll be saved from the deadness of your sins into new life in Him. Amen? And the second resurrection, will we, He will come back and on the last day, He says, I will raise my people and He will give you a new glorified body and He will take you to be with glory, to, 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 to go to glory with Him you're in your new resurrected body. Now, when that happens, some of us may have already been in heaven a number of years in our spiritual bodies, but he will raise us from the dead and give us a new body in which we will serve him in glory. So this resurrection that we confess, not just that Christ died, this is the problem with Christ only as saviour. Because as saviour, we're only confessing his death. In, in one sense. But as Lord, we're confessing him as Lord over all things, including death. 
So this is why it has to be the confession of Jesus as Lord, not just over death, but over life and over my life. He is Lord of all. And that's what lordship means. He is owner of all things. From him, through him, and to him are all things. So we've got this beautiful picture here of what God has done in the Lord Jesus Christ. If he was not raised from the dead, as we know, of all men we are the most miserable, for Christ still lies in a grave, and all of his promises for eternal life are good for nothing. Yet, saints, this is the case for every other self-proclaimed spiritual guru, cult leader, self-styled styled saviour, put too many S's in that, tyrannical king and Caesar, whoever proclaim themselves as gods, they all lie in graves today. Their bones scattered amongst the dust of the earth, and only Christ and Christ only has emerged from the grave proving that he not only paid for sins, but he also conquered death in the process. This is the great hope, of course. Christ's resurrection was the supreme validation of his ministry. So when we put our faith in Christ and confess him, we not only confess him as Christ crucified, but Christ resurrected, or Christus victor, if you like. Now, i I want to just throw something in extra here because this is where it just sort of turns up the notch a little bit on this in the fact that Christ not only died but he resurrected. But when we see resurrection happen, and Jesus, of course, resurrected people in his life, didn't he? Went into funerals and he raised the dead. He saw the widow's son and raised her, if you like. And so this whole idea that God raised him from the dead. Well, we spent on Friday establishing the fact that Jesus was both what? God and man. So when we confess that God raised him from the dead, in actual fact, that confession is that Jesus, as God, raised himself. It's one thing to say that, well, hey, uh, you know, I prayed for somebody and they got risen from the dead. That is not what happened here. Jesus raised himself from the dead. That's what God does because he's got the power of life. So his body's lying there in its humanity and God himself, Jesus, raises himself and literally he comes to life again. John 2.19, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again. Of course, we know God the Father, God the Son and God the Spirit all were a part of this dynamic resurrection, but it can be said truly that Jesus is God and Jesus himself rose himself from the dead. He, as God, raised himself. This is why Jesus could truly say, as he's having a conversation, well, I know on the last day that they'll be risen and they will have life. No, Jesus said, you're not getting it. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Sixthly, in verse 9, it is a confession, and it is a public confession of your faith. It is not to be done in secret, but for all the church to know who is your master, who is your Lord, who you have pledged your life to serve. If we go back, sorry, I'm flicking back to Romans 10 here again. If you will confess with your mouth, if it's coming out of your mouth, somebody should be able to hear it. It is a public confession of your faith. John Angle James, confession means to declare publicly and solemnly something that we believe that we intend to do so. A confession of Christianity signifies a public, solemn and emphatic declaration that we believe the truths and submit to the obligations of Christianity. We live in a world where Christianity has been privatized. I can stay at home. I don't have to go to church. I can watch somebody on YouTube every week and, and I've done my diligence. I've done my duty. No, Christianity is for a gathered group of public people. Amen. It is for the gathered, called out saints to confess their uh, love for Christ in public, to sing in public, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and to preach the gospel. This is why baptism is a formal part of this confession, isn't it? 
It's one of the sacred sacraments of the church, although you can become a Christian at any point that the Lord grants you faith and repentance to believe on Him, your baptism is that formal public recognition and confession before a Christian congregation that you are now living for Christ. As you go under the water, what do you tell the gathered church and anyone else that's there to see you? You died in Christ. What's your confession? That God is going to raise you from the dead like He did Christ. You were buried in Him by baptism into the water, which is why we do full immersion. You are buried, you've gone under, and you come up out of the water, as Jesus did, as John the Baptist baptised Him, and you testify to His resurrecting life in you. This is why baptism is one of the marks of the true church. It is a public confession that I have of a spiritual truth. And this is why we are told by Jesus in the Great Commission, don't just preach me, baptize people into me. And then go on and disciple people in obedience to all I have commanded you. This is going on to that righteous life. Beautiful picture there of what we're called to do. The old and the new. Maybe today there are some here who are not water baptised. Please know I'm not preaching you have to be water baptised to be saved. I need to be clear on that or else the thief on the cross needs to have a pretty quick baptism. No chance to even sprinkle that guy but he gets to heaven. So here we go. You've got this opportunity today to say I need to be baptised. It's a step of obedience. In actual fact, as a pastor, I believe it's one of the first steps of obedience, as Jesus said to John the Baptist, to fulfill all righteousness. That is to obey what has been commanded of you. Beautiful picture there. I'm up to number six and we're done on that. Now, lastly, we are saved to Christ, into him. But sometimes we neglect the fact that we have been saved from something. What have we been saved from? Well, if you believe that Jesus is Lord, you confess him with your mouth, you believe in your heart that Jesus, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from your own sins, that in the power and uh, in the power of your own sins, they've got enough to damn your soul to hell. Save from a holy God who must punish sin with death, the wages of sin are death. Save from Satan who has the power that if you die in your sins today, he still has dominion over your soul to drag you to that place where I'm sure you don't want to be going. You must bear the wages of your own sins and receive payment or pay for them in the eternal flames. Save from your own sinful desires. When you live for Christ, you put Him on. You leave your old life behind. You are given over to the love of God in your heart so that you can no longer live the way you used to live. You're living righteous living now. You're walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. You are set free from sin's dominion. You are given the ability by the help of the Spirit and with a new regenerated heart to say no to your old ways and live in a God-glorifying way to Christ Jesus, walking in that fullness of peace and joy. Christ, in essence, has become all-sufficient for you. Verse 9 has a lot in it, doesn't it? But we need to move on to verse 10 today. Verse 10 is a confession regarding the salvation of your soul. So we believe on Christ, we confess from the heart. Paul now tells us how this confession now works. Firstly, it works in a belief that continues to be borne out in the fruit of righteousness. We don't just believe in Christ and that's it. Many of us have met people who well, I believe. I believe in Jesus. What, do you believe in him just as a historical figure? Do you believe in him as someone that did a lot of good in the world while he was here? No, we must believe in him as both 
Savior and Lord, and then that belief is outworked in following Him in righteousness. Saints, it is clear in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 19, that James teaches that even demons have an orthodox belief in Jesus being the Son of God. They know that God took on flesh. They know and have an orthodox confession. Yes, even demons, chapter 2, verse 19 of James. Mark, chapter 1, verse 23 and 24. What have we to do with you, Jesus, Son of God? Anyone can confess Jesus is the Son of God, even a demon that's on a one-way track to hell. That is not enough to save you. You do well, James says. The demons also believe and shudder. This confession, verse 10, must come from a regenerated heart and it must go through to righteousness. Do you see that in verse 10? From with the heart, man believes through to righteousness. If your life is not more heading in that righteous direction and you're still living like the devil, you can confess whatever you want. I know from your fruit, you're not a Christian. Ultimately, God determines that in the final judgment, but by your fruits, you will know them. So there must be fruits worthy of repentance. And these fruits are fruits of righteousness. If you're not convinced, let's go to some scriptures here. Philippians 1.11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Your life is not just a one point in time confession. It is a life that's outworked to the glory of Jesus Christ that bears fruits of righteousness to the praise of God. Your life should be praiseworthy to him. Proverbs 11.3, the fruits of the righteous are a tree of life. James 3.18, peacemakers who sow in peace reap the fruit of righteousness. Ephesians 5.8, we've got up there as well. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. How are you light? You are walking as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Light is not some theory that we say, well, we're light. We're the light of the world. What is that light? It's fruit. It's fruit of a godly life outworked based on your confession. Your confession has fruit. That fruit is seen according to the book of Ephesians in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Secondly, our confession is not just to righteousness, but it is made unto salvation. That is, it goes a confession that goes all the way through to salvation. This confession not only bears fruit, that is a Christ-like life, it is continual and consistent. Do you get that, Christian? Your confession should be outworked in a continual, consistent life of godliness. Now, I understand sometimes as you're heading up the highway of holiness, that you can, some days it's like one step forward, three steps back. I get that. That's your humanity to keep you humble. But until then, we endeavour to follow the, and, and obey the means of grace, the fellowshipping, the reading of the scripture, the praying, all the things we're called to do in obedience to God's word. And as we do that, trusting that it's God at work within us, we head up the highway of holiness and we persevere unto the end. This confession is the story of, of our lives. Confession, as I said to you, is not just the words we speak, it's our holiness of character, it's the life we live. Thomas Brooks put it this way, wonderful quote by him, perseverance is one of those prime things which accompanies salvation. Matthew 10, you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures to the end shall be what? Saved. Not he who makes a confession at the altar. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Now that's either going to be the end of your life or the end until Christ comes back for you. But true Christians don't fall away. They don't lose their salvation. According to Matthew, those who are truly saved endure all the way to the end. It's called what for us in the Reformed Church? The perseverance of the saints, isn't it? We persevere not because of our own goodness or ability, but because it's God who is at work within us and he's going to keep us 
Our job, that's God's sovereignty, but our job is to apply ourselves to our confession and to outwork that in fear and holiness and righteousness until the end. We persevere. So this confession from the mouth only, just to say it from our mouths only, is not what saves you. It must come from a regenerated heart as we've talked about. I'm going to talk now about why people confess but they don't make it to the end. Many of us in this room know people who have confessed Christ but they're no longer following Christ. If anything, it's almost made them worse. Anyone can confess anything, let's be honest. A confession can be forced. A confession can be coerced. It can be an emotively manipulated in an evangelistic rally from you, which is the way Charles Finney did it. He said if we can emotively get people to make decisions, and if you're taking notes, this is something you need to look at because it's done in a lot of churches today. It's called decisional regeneration. If we can just get people to make decisions, we can get people saved. That is a lie. We know today, we know from Scripture that only God saves people when he awakens their heart from the deadness of sins. You can confess all you want, but it doesn't mean you're going to be saved. God has to do a work in you, amen? So here we go. For confession, what the Lord is looking for is not a confession to keep you out of hell or to please your friends or to ease your guilty conscience, no. The Lord desires confession to be made from the heart, from your innermost being that acknowledges that your only hope and faith is in one place that is in Christ. Now, in Christ and him alone, that faithful confession, for that to happen, God has to change your heart so that, listen to me, you can be given faith to believe and a new heart to confess. So let's go back. For you to actually confess from your heart that Jesus, and with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, what's got to happen first? You've got to be given faith to believe that and you've got to be given a new heart because you've got to speak it from your heart. This, saints, is why we believe in the order of salvation, the auto salutis. That regeneration, you being given a new heart and being given the Spirit of God that awakens you from the deadness of sins, that internal resurrection into Christ has to happen before you are given faith to believe and confess that Jesus is Lord. Regeneration, then faith, then confession. So when you confess, you're already saved because God's done a work in your heart. Not, I confess and then I'm saved. Did you get that? Or else we believe in decisional regeneration. And that is not how God works. God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the confession first. Come on, the people of Israel, they worshipped God, they did all these things, and God says, away with you, away with your sacrifices, away with your offerings, because it comes from a corrupt heart. The heart must be changed first, and from the heart, we're given faith to confess him, which is why salvation is not up to you it's up to god who regenerates our heart and gives us faith to believe and to confess on him which should humble us all the more amen because god chose us to save us that we would have the privilege of being able to confess him as lord and savior wow what a humbling doctrine so yes others believe that we confess And then Christ comes into our heart. This is incorrect and unbiblical. Let me read for you something here from, I called uh, Tim Challies. He says, The risk we take in telling people that they have been saved after they have marked a card or raised their hand is that we know only that they have made some type of decision. The decision may be sincere and well-intentioned, but it does not necessarily indicate that the Spirit has regenerated the person. Charles Finney's legacy in church history is largely one of failure. 
of creating masses of people who believed that they were Christians, most of whom showed no evidence, no fruit. They were assured by their decision, which they could always regard as the milestone in their lives, but while they had raised their hand, they had never turned to Christ. Why had they not done this? Because the Spirit had not done any work in them, and they were thus unregenerate. They had attempted to make themselves believers a task which can only be done by God. The same problem prevails today. When we tell people that their decision is indicative of their salvation, we may give them false hope or false assurance. We may give them assurance that is not ours to give. The biblical reality is that God gives salvation to whom he wishes. John 5, 21, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Son gives life to whom he will. Joseph Aline here, Never think you can convert yourself. If you ever would be savingly converted, you must despair of doing so in, in your own strength. It is a resurrection from the dead, Ephesians 2.1, a new creation and a work of absolute omnipotence. Trust you've received the word of truth there. Point three, as we close out this morning, verse 11, a confession regarding Scripture's promise. Here's the icing on the cake. For the Scripture says, Paul tells the Romans in verse 11, whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. It is the testimony of Scripture, Paul says. Well, where in Scripture? Well, in Isaiah 28, verse 16, he that believes shall not make haste. What is Paul doing? He's saying in the Old Testament, this glorious truth was made clear in the Old Testament. How were the Old Testament saved? By faith in looking forward to Christ. How are we saved? By faith in looking back to what Christ has done. In Psalm 25, verse 3, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. It can also allude to the fact that the whole body of doctrine points to the fact that whoever believes on Christ will not be ashamed. Abraham believed in faith and what? It was attributed to him as righteousness. Abraham saw Christ's righteousness because he believed on what Christ would do in faith as he laid his own son on the altar and found out that God himself was going to provide a sacrifice and it didn't need to be Isaac. But Isaac was typified as being the only son that would be given for the sacrifice of our sins. And literally, Abraham saw the resurrection because in Abraham's heart, he'd already put his son to death. And he saw his own son resurrected before his eyes. William Plumer he asked the question, how will I be ashamed? You know, how would I be ashamed? Let's look at the negative. I mean, you know, all those who believe in Christ will not be ashamed. Well, how would I be ashamed if I didn't believe on Christ? Well, if you love not salvation, Plumer says, you love not the Lord Jesus, and you will be accursed when he comes. He who hates salvation, that's the message we've been preaching this morning, he says, loves death. Friend, hear me today. You hate the gospel, you love death. That's actually what you're doing. If you despise grace, you despise your own mercy. Prophets, apostles, martyrs, and the people of God of every age have not ceased to proclaim, and upon divine authority too, that Christ is our life. Neither is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven by which men were given among men, whereby they must be saved. Acts 4.12 And how dreadful it will be to perish with the offer of mercy pressed upon us by the Lord. We shall die without remedy because we shall then have sinned against the only remedy. Saints, we must look to him and live. Well, on the positive note, we don't want to be ashamed. We don't want to turn down the remedy. We want to be unashamed, don't we? 
How will we not be ashamed? Well, we will not be ashamed because we have lived for the one who is worthy to lay our lives down for, proven our love to him by obeying his word. Hear the psalmist here, Psalm 119 verse 6, Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect to all your commandments. What's the key to not being ashamed? Loving the Lord, obeying his word. Secondly, we won't be ashamed because at the judgment seat, it will be there that we'll be awarded all of our rewards for being stewards of the salvation and confession that we were called to steward. And we get to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. We will be those workmen in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 that need not be ashamed. We will not have to be ashamed for we will be found not in our own sins but clothed in Christ's righteousness. Christ, Romans chapter 10 verse 4, being the end or the goal of our righteousness. We will not be ashamed for we had one great object in this life to bring glory to God the Father by doing those things that are pleasing to him. We will not be ashamed for we have labored together with Christ, yoked together with him in gentleness and humility, taking his yoke upon us, loving the church, laboring in the church in gentleness and meekness. We will not have to be ashamed because we have known whom we have believed and we are persuaded that he is able to keep that, is, that has, which has been committed to him until that day. And we will not have to be ashamed, church, because we have not been ashamed of the gospel, which is not just Christ's life, but his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his glorification, and his soon coming again. In conclusion here, J.C. Ryle says, what should this result in for the Christian's life, living in this life of righteousness, confessing unto salvation? He says it ends in a life where we would be never be ashamed of our giving nature. We're given over now to serve the Lord. We're given over now to serve him. He says, if you profess to have any hope in Christ, give freely, liberally, and self-denyingly, according as you have power and opportunity. Let not your love consist in nothing more than vague expressions of kindness and compassion. Make proof of it by actions. Help forward the cause of Christ on the earth by money, by influence, by pains, by prayer. If God so loved you as to give his son for your soul, you should count it a privilege and not a burden to give what you can to do good to men. Now, the question remains... Will today be the day that you call on the name of the Lord, that you confess Jesus as Lord, that God raised him from the dead? Is today the day that you can confess from your heart, from a regenerated heart, that God has awakened during the service, God has given you faith to see Christ clearly crucified and risen before you? He has given you the will, the drive, so to speak, in that he has given you faith to believe and grace to repent of your sins and to call Christ as Lord. This is the whole scope and nature of Scripture. The psalmist, save your people, bless your inheritance. You should call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. It is a faithful saying, 1 Timothy 1.15, worthy of all acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief. He is able to save to the uttermost all who by God come to him. Israel shall be saved, the great promise in Isaiah 45.17. Paul will see the answer to his prayers all those whom Christ died for in Israel will be saved and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with an everlasting salvation. Psalm 25, 5. God has chosen you to salvation. Saints, today, we not only believe in the atoning death, we believe in in the resurrecting life of Christ, not just in him, 
but in all of his future church who will come to faith and call in his name and call him Lord. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord God, that the promise of Scripture remains sure. He who confesses Christ as Lord, who believes in Christ as dying for sins and being risen from the dead, shall be saved and not ashamed. Thank you that we have our resurrected Saviour's words that because I live, you shall live also. And that all that the Father has given to you, Lord, you will raise up on that last day. Lord Jesus, may our lives bring glory to your name until we see you face to face and bow our knee again to you, confessing you as King of kings and Lord of lords. We thank you for this all in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Please stand for the reading of the benediction. And now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with ever, everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Blessings, please be seated. Thank you, Saints. What a great